two miles if we could get this one. All right, uh, she walks in New York. Uh, okay, so um, one more talk before we um, do the complicated stuff. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Andrea Schaefer, who um, I tried to look through everything that all the various transitions has gone, and I, I can't do it. I'll tell you the kind of the categorization rather than the discrimination, if you will. So he did his, uh, his undergraduate diploma in physics in uh, uh, was it Holding in Heidelberg, yeah, and then also stayed there to do his PhD in uh, Bert Sackmann's supergroup. And then after that, went to London uh, to try Margaret's at that time at UCL to do a postdoc, and then stayed on there as uh, some fancy fellow, which became an independent position. The point is, it was an independent position there before he moved off to the Max Planck uh, in Heidelberg, and then became a professor in the University of Heidelberg. I think promptly uh, decamped back to London. Trouble keeping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I want to see something first, which then became latest Francis Crick Institute, which is where you will be for the next year or so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank, thanks, Manky, for the uh, somewhat worryingly detailed uh, uh, introduction. Um, it's just I've moved back between Germany and between Heidelberg and London a few times, so, and now I'm I'm uh, happily happily in in Brexit, uh, Britain. So, um, well, thanks a lot for, uh, for this um, amazing, amazing conference and giving me the opportunity to talk here. Um, in particular, because of a couple of people in the audience, I was very excited to have here, particularly Antonio Massimo, as you will see later on. So, for the last um, day, we've been talking a lot about chemicals, chemicals like these that evoke activity in the brain, how they are received, perceived, encoded, and so on. Um, maybe not surprising on a, in an olfaction uh, meeting, but I want to. Now I'll focus on, on a slightly different aspect of olfaction that maybe sounded through in Tim's talk and yesterday. Namely, looking at this sort of turbulent, let's call it an odor plume, or that's actually a smoke plume, there's just a lot of structure and a lot, a lot of dynamic information way beyond just the chemical, uh, the chemical composition. I find that a particularly exciting avenue to go down to try to understand how the olfactory system deals with. And a lot of people around the world seem to agree with how exciting that kind of project might become. So what does this sort of spatial, turbulent, um, uh, turbulent cloud of odor, how does that reflect into the point source that maybe a, a nose would be in here? Well, if you stick a detector, a fast detector in here, you see these sort of rapid temporal fluctuations that happen, I guess it's safe to say, across all kinds of time scale, up to several tens or hundreds, uh, hundreds of hertz. So there's a very rich temporal structure in an odor plume. And the question that I'm trying to get a little bit into in the next um, half hour or so is, what they could be used for and how they might be uh, how they might be processed. So I'm certainly not the not the first to look at that. Um, so studying the dynamics of uh, plumes is, has been done for, for probably for centuries. This is one of the sort of maybe earlier meteorological um, papers where where, um, where this group looked at a large smoke plume. I think from a sort of to study forest fire smoke as well. Um, and looked at different distances. And you already see that uh, at 80 meters, so very different length scales than we usually deal with. It's a very different temporal structure that at some, something approaching half a kilometer. But you still see even half a kilometer away from the source, you see dynamics in, in the, in this case again, smoke plume. More towards neuroscience, a lot of groups in particular working in sort of marine organisms have looked at uh, plumes for a long time. I think some aspect maybe because marine organisms allow you to study plumes in water, and as Tim has already said, you know, it's much easier to visualize something in a liquid uh, water environment than in air, where a lot of the normally fluorescent molecules just become suppressed, I think, largely by oxygen and nitrogen. So this is one of the, again, earlier studies from these groups I'd never met personally, actually, so far, but the sort of pioneers in studying turbulence in, in, uh, in liquids and using saline traces or identifying different features of such an odor plume, so measuring what typical neurophysiologists would measure, peaks and SDs and lengths and gaps and so forth. Um, maybe the most, most sort of well-known from a neuroscience, neurocircuits perspective along the lines of, um, of turbulence and the role of turbulence certainly comes from the, um, from the insect, insect world. And this sort of a, a part of a famous paper by Hildebrand's group also quite a while ago this point showing that at different positions uh, along the plume, along the plume, you do see very different, or just qualitative, very different kind of temporal structures. And this is sort of a very uh, much more recent, I think probably the best attempt to actually have a quantitative, a quantitative understanding of and prediction about about turbulence and concentration variance at different 
at different positions from well, Antonio and uh, Massimo. So um, there's still, I don't want to exactly talk about this, talk about turbulence and distance and direction. I think that's a very, very fascinating, very interesting topic. But I want to now kind of look at a different aspect that turbulence and odor plumes might be, might be good for. And that goes back to, for me to a paper that has been quite influential for just my small personal uh, experience. This is the paper that got me into olfaction. I was in summer school in 1998 as a, as a student and randomly got assigned to read some paper, a different one, not this one, but someone else was presenting this paper. And I got very, very excited by this uh, work in PNS from 19, 1991 from John Hopfield, where he says that animals are, that are dependent on olfaction must obtain a description of the spatial location and individual odor quality. So again, in the direction of what Tim was saying, but also odor quality. They must get this uh, description um, through, uh, through odor olfaction alone, which I think is a strong argument for nocturnal or crepuscular animals like the lab mammals we work with, like mice or mice or rats. They must get a description of their spatial environment through olfaction. And he argues in this paper that the variable nature of the turbulent airflow actually makes such a problem more tractable and makes it computationally feasible and even argues that the olfactory bulb would be a very good implementation of the computational algorithms he proposes in this paper. So what does John Hopfield mean with this, with this problem? Well, let's take this sort of, sort of slightly, clouded, slightly clouded picture um, where you see, um, if you imagine you're kind of a, a, a somewhere a mouse or something sitting in here or here on the, on the other screen, then what's, what, what are you going to be challenged with? Well, you're going to be challenged with a lot of different odors from all over the environment. Certainly there will be some chemicals that on their own will give you a lot of important information about a specific mate or so, but there will be a lot of information, a lot of um, chemicals that indicate, let's say, that this flower is close and other chemicals that would indicate that this sort of, I don't know, animal, this deer will be present in the scenery. And what you have to do to kind of figure out which of those chemicals belong to the flower, which of those chemicals that might be partially overlapping belong to other flowers, belong to this specific, uh, this specific uh, deer if you want to be able to allocate objects in the scenery just using your sense of, your sense of smell. Maybe a more natural environment for a mouse would be this Victoria, Victoria tube stop, where a mouse tend, tends to live in here and wants to maybe understand whether the cheese sandwich here is actually a cheese sandwich, although you get, might get a lot of cheesy smells from, from all, over those, all over those people as well. So, so that's the kind of challenge um, I think is one of the key ones that so far has not been addressed very much in effect. And how do you seg separate your environment? How do you segment your scene, figure out which chemicals, which chemicals belong to a specific odor source, the cheese sandwich or the shoes or the armpits or whatever, whatever you find in Victoria tube stuff. Um, so the idea that Hopfield put forward as well, there is rich temporal structure in those natural plumes, in normal turbulent environments. And one of the key features would, would be, so he argued, that um, chemicals that come from the same source, let's say the cheese sandwich here, they would all fluctuate a lot, but they would fluctuate in a very highly, highly correlated manner. Because again, as we sort of discussed a little bit earlier today, diffusion over these scales generally plays a much less prominent role than sort of turbulent, turbulent uh, airflow in terms of carrying chemicals. So whether these, these different chemicals have different Diffusional constants doesn't matter so much as the fact that they might be carried by the same kind of little air turbulences. Whereas odors that belong to a different source, like these, are again are highly dynamic, but they will be correlated within, but not correlated so much maybe with the with the other the other group of odors. So that's the idea that would allow allow an animal to segment a scene to figure out which chemicals below to belong to one, which chemicals that again might be overlapping belong to a different source. Just sort of figuring out whether the green and the square and the red and the triangle belong together, so whether it's a green square and a red triangle or a green triangle and a red square and so on. So this is sort of the general idea of scene segmentation or an auditory system, as all of you uh, know very well. It's called the auditory cocktail party effect, the idea being that if you communicate with one person, you need to understand their, all the components that make up the, the sounds they make as being separate sources and all the background, all the background activity. So this scene segmentation or cocktail party party effect or binding or whatever you want to call it, I think is very prominent in olfaction. Um, and some people, I can't remember who it was, mentioned that specific, even a specific combination of smells have very different ethological meaning even for, for insects than the, than the components in itself, which would be a very good example if I could remember who exactly said that and what it was. 
Um, so I couldn't resist putting up this, this beautiful picture from, uh, that's the cover of uh, Nature Neuroscience from a paper from Dan, Dan Venke, where they um, tackle a very, very similar pro problem, the sort of figure ground separation, and show that individual odors can be identified in the, in the context of varying, of, of the very highly different background odors. So they look essentially at the static way of separate, identifying individual, uh, individual odors in, um, uh, sort of in the context of a large, array of different background orders. And I think Dan might be talking about that to some extent. Yeah, that, yeah. so in tomorrow, I think, or, or that tomorrow. So, um, so to visualize a little bit, to give you a bit more intuition, again, this is still kind of a very lengthy introduction. I tend to not do much introduction to <laughs> visualize what, uh, what, what the problem I'm trying to, trying to address here. These are just two, bun two little blobs of dry ice and image from top. And, and simply using a color scale. And you see, you know, it's a very dynamic, dynamic airflow that's here tracked by this sort of dry ice plume. That you can imagine that if you're here, you see these bouts of, active, bouts of um, odor or dry ice coming from this source. You see them coming from this source. And they seem to be sufficiently complex that you might be able to attribute different chemicals from one source and distinguish them from the chemicals coming from a different source. So how can we address this problem properly? Well, what we want to do is we want to, uh, to uh, compare a mixture of odorants and compare two odor sources that contain exactly the same chemicals. We want to understand whether there is, a ch uh, whether there is um, a, a differences in, in correlation. If you measure it, let's say, half a meter or so away to stay in the length scale that's relevant for mice. The way we do that is using photoionization detectors. 95% of you probably use them themselves or know them for those 5% that don't. Um, the idea is a very simple one. You, you, suck in, you suck in, and these are commercial devices, you suck in odorized air into a structure where you apply sort of UV light. UV light with a specific wavelength that's going to ionize everything that is, is more ionizable than this specific, specific energy. Then you apply a high voltage to separate, to separate those ions and then simply measure the current, uh, sort of a sensitive amplifier, measure the current that is proportional for large concentration ranges to the specific concentration. These devices can be, can be very fast and detect, sort of, they detect everything below a specific specific ionization, uh, ionization energy and can be very fast of a bandwidth of several hundreds, several hundreds of hertz. Um, so what we have to do now if we want to me measure these mixtures or individual components, we have to actually have PIDs for two different, for two different uh, kind of odors to simultaneously measure these temporal correlations. Problem there is that um, the commercial PIDs don't tend to not have that, but if we could get, get to several different lamp energies, we could have one that only ionizes one specific component of um, one specific odorant, so would be sensitive only to this bluish one, and others that would be oops, others that would be sensitive to uh, a large group of different uh, group of different odorants. And then taking both measurements together, we could piece a piece apart which odor is present. So what we actually took is this this device that many of you are using, so Aurora Mini PID, with a bit of help from Aurora, we managed to find other UV lamps that actually fit in there. Unfortunately, most of them seem to be not produced anymore. Then you need to modify the PID a little bit, sort of its resonance circuitry, to allow it to operate with this different lamp. And then you need to find odors um, that have sufficiently different ionization energy that are not too toxic for your, um, for your uh, postdocs and PhD students. Um, so, so the two odorants we picked um, is ethyl butyrate or many, many others that have a relatively high ionization energy of close to 10 electron volts. But there are not so many volatile chemicals that are not toxic that are, have a relatively low one. Alpha terpenine, terpenine is one we're using. So these are now two model orders we can use. This one being, being, um, being um, sensed by both PIDs with, a two, with two different lamps. And this one only being, sensed, only being sensed by the higher energy one. So very simple. You take those two, those two odorants. If they're mixed in some sort of dynamic way, we have one high energy one that that detects all odorants, the low energy one that detects only one of the odorants. And then essentially we can take the difference of the two to get um, to, get to one. Um, one last sentence. Uh, the, the, there's, they have slightly different filter properties. There's some scaling factors, but in essence, that's what we need to do. So the ones we looked at, the temporal bandwidth would not be high enough to, I mean, we think, you know, hundreds, hundreds of hertz, probably the olfactory system is not faster than that. So we want to see hundreds of hertz, but the ones I saw were kind of in the more hertz or a few hertz, which would have been too slow. Obviously, if you go to water, you could use fluorescence and look at fluorescent dye, but, um, but for, um, for air, it seems, if anyone has a better idea, I would be enthusiastic to try, to try something else. 
So what's the outcome of these experiments? Again, as I said, we have two sources, approximately 50 centimeters apart in a turbulent environment. Um, we measure odor one, which is our ethyl butyrate, and then after processing a little bit, odor, or, or, the both are after a little bit processing, that's the concentration of odor one, that's the concentration of odor two. Two different sources, both look, look kind of dynamic, but they don't seem to be high, very highly correlated. We go to the mixture, however, again, same distance, we see highly correlated temporal fluctuations. So in this sort of example, you clearly, if, if things are correlated, you know it was the mixture. If things are less, less well correlated, you know it, two independent sources. And that is very robust. It's truly, if you do that sort of tens of times, you see always highly correlated mixture, always barely correlated or, or uncorrelated um, two individual components. So in principle, the information seems to be there. It's actually relatively gradual. If you go, go sort of tens of centimeters apart, it's somewhere weakly correlated. Um, this is all done indoors, where we don't have contaminant odorants, and we create turbulence by fans with little cylinders in front. Um, we're not yet at a stage where we could actually calculate the turbulence to see whether we understand everything. Um, but if we go outdoors onto my, my slightly oversized, um, oversized and windy and rainy balcony with all kinds of background, background odorants, we do see the same strong significant high correlation despite all the background going on for a mixture and weak to no correlation for, um, for 50 centimeters apart. So this is without doing anything except placing vials of odorants onto, onto our balcony and measure with, with two PIDs 50 centimeters apart. So there's flowers, there's hopefully not rats, but all kinds of other smells around that, that do reduce this correlation as well as increase this correlation. So it's a quite a robust phenomenon. It's so robust that if you go to different distances, so much closer where you see stronger, stronger temporal variants or uh, further away where you see weaker ones, you still see this massive difference in correlation between mixture and two components. And obviously we tried another odor pair we could find and again it's the same kind of, kind of behavior. So the PID is uh, between 20 and 60 centimeters and the two odors are between mixed and 50 centimeters. Um, so we tried to be in a length scale that we then could do, for example, navigation or experiments in a lab, and it seemed, seemed not too small, uh, not massively too small a length scale for, for our mice. Really, only the correlation changes if you look at any of the other pieces combined So, um, so there is there's a lot of there's a lot of temporal structure, and this temporal structure there there's a a lot. Of, um, a lot of information in there about things like distance and direction and so on. But in principle, those two should be the same because, I mean, if it's, a, it's a physical mixture. Um, the individual odorant is still present at exactly the same distance. We have started looking at quantifying these things, but we are way not as qualified as uh, some other people in the room to do it properly. It's, not, it's certainly not a trivial problem what kind of the measures are that you would have at a specific, as a specific distance. But I think a very interesting one. Did you? Yeah. We see, we see, so these, um, these sort of bulk, bulk correlations are done with many, many repeats, even independent days. So the correlations say the same. The structure itself, it varies, is different. Um, yeah, again, again, it's essentially a similar answer to Matt. We might not understand the temporal structure. What we do understand is that they're weakly correlated and highly correlated in those two cases. And, okay. Very So, um, so we use, for, for simple technical reasons of finding odorants with a low enough ionization energy, we did these two odor pairs where we find the same correlated versus uncorrelated. I think they are a sort of different temporal structure. You would start getting a situation where diffusion becomes a relevant, a relevant transport mechanism. Yeah, no, so, so what... Yeah. Yeah. So I think we discussed that paper even already kind of a few months ago. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, so what we're doing, we've been trying those, those four odorants, very simply have a little robot opening a lid because we don't want to push air out, very similar to what Tim was saying. We don't want to push air somewhere. We just open up and then, then wait for 10 seconds, or initially we just did it manually. We haven't systematically gone through many odorants. Maybe if one focuses on just the temporal structure and not several odorants, then it would be very feasible to do. But that's essentially, I would think, what that paper did in, I don't think there's a good the quantitative theory behind it, but just because it's very difficult to do. But maybe we can discuss yeah, that yeah, yeah. This afterwards. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, that's right. But it's just a high eye that even these two are different correlations initially, and then they're different in the end. Yeah. And so the correlation is different. 
Yeah, um, I think it's well, well possible because what we're doing is we're actually lifting two lids. We try to not lift them too fast to not create kind of, right, but we will have correlation to the onset. So, so the measurements we actually do for this correlation coefficient are only for the period of older presentations. So obviously, if we correlate the entire trace, there would be a strong correlation simply because of the sort of onset, onset effect. Um, I think that's more a technical flaw in the way we can present and can get lots of odorants and conditions because the more natural situation is, you know, flowers and animals sit around and, and maybe there's an additional, additional effect from an animal moving so that everything gets emitted at the same time. So generally, I think from these sort of experiments that, um, that are somewhat intuitive from what one knows about sort of turbulent, turbulent transport, what we would, would conclude is that the dynamics of odors indeed following Hopfield's ideas allow for sort of scene segmentation or object identification, or if you want to use a maybe, maybe not, not any more overused term for binding of different components. So the question we now want to, of course, ask is can mammals use this kind of, uh, this kind of information? And um, so in particular, if you sort of look at some of the spectrum, I should have put a spectrum here, I guess. The, there's information up into the tens of hertz or even hundreds of hertz where you find very tight correlation. So it might be a stretch to figure out whether a mouse that usually, I don't know, sniffs at 5 to 12 hertz or so maybe, that, that mice would be, and with slow receptor neurons, that they would be using this kind or be able to use this kind of information. There are several reasons why I don't think it's too far a stretch to try. One obviously comes from, from insects where a lot of work, in particular by Paul, um, somewhere in, in the room, up here, by Paul, um, showing that, um, that uh, bees are very good or, um, in detecting instantaneous or co correlated onset or um, sort of simultaneous or slightly shifted on, so down to, down to uh, timescales of several milliseconds. So there is definitely an olfactory system out there that would be able to at least detect onsets, maybe not correlations, but onsets in activity. And again, this old work from... from uh, Maybe we can try to discuss that in the end. The simple answer to the question that Dima will ask is we haven't yet measured sniffing during the tasks I will show, but we are about to do that. So we don't know exactly, and we don't know mechanistically very well. The presentation so. on the previous slide, I referred to the disparity in the um, PPM between the things like... I think it's volatility, volatility of the two odorants. But then how do you deal with the, uh, the sensitivity? Like of the PID? Yeah, it's going to be noisier with yeah. the... Uh, that's a problem. That that is all. That is all stuff that is actually in the. Uh, sorry, that's in the error bars of our of our measurements here. The reason that there's not it's not one correlation or a particular outdoor is the fact that we do have noise. In particular, the the. I don't know. Probably maybe a couple of people are interested in this. Technically, these these beautiful mini PIDs, if you tune them for a lamp that is outside their normal range, become somewhat unstable, mm -hmm. and actually actually you do get noise. Mm -hmm. And then then finding chemicals that have a that have a substantial, that are below that lower um, ionization threshold, they tend to be relatively close to the ionization threshold. So it's very inefficient to actually, to actually. So the calibration, I should have said, and actually Debundon has done that, warned me again today. This is definitely, this is a very well calibrated measurement. This is much less, less easily um, calib calibratable because of exactly those noise and PID issues. But for the sake of the correlations, because we're comparing two conditions that are, that's fell into the same problem, I don't think it matters too much. So in the insect world, definitely there's, um, there's indication that also um, sort of projection neurons um, in moths, I think, can follow fluctuations of the um, of odor concentrations um, and work by many labs, including, I don't know, Rachel Wilson's lab um, and um, Marcus, um, Marcus Meister and Jean Laurent, I think, are both collaborating with this, this paper. In crustaceans, there's um, maybe indirect evidence that, that crabs navigating seem to make use of turbulence, or at least it's difficult to explain without that. Um, so there's maybe indirect evidence that they can perceive those kind of turbulences. In mammals, I think evidence is, um, in mammals it's maybe a, maybe a different issue. And this is, I think, the only slide that's published data from, from my lab, you know, from mine and Dima's and, and Zach and many other uh, labs work. Um, we know that at least mammalian olfaction is not incredibly slow. So we can do simple detection and discrimination um, tasks can, can happen much slower than people thought maybe 20 years ago. 
And most importantly, in this case, from, from Dima's work, we know that if, you're, if you give very precise inputs optogenetically, um, mice are very good in discriminating on the order of tens of milliseconds or even you know, 10, 20 milliseconds. So there is the potential of the system to deal with, with high temporal, high temporal um, temporally structured stimuli, and the system itself can actually respond in a quite, in a quite precise manner. So what do we have to do if we want to figure out whether mice are really able to use those turbulent, this turbulent um, information? Well, the first thing we have to do is to be able to reproduce, reproduce temporal dynamics in a, reproducible, in a reproducible manner. So we have to get away from what we're trying to do um, to create sort of square odor pulses to have a defined onset and offset. We need to go somewhere that we can reproduce those kind of fluctuating, um, fluctuating um, uh, odor stimuli. Um, and that is a, a little bit of an... Um, finding and engineering effort, we ended up using these Lee micro dispense valves that can operate at up to 1200 hertz with very small, very small volumes. So then if you use them and some, some manifolds do some sort of electronic control of them to create the right kind of pulses, you actually have quite a small dead volume and can create pulses that should be at least in the sort of tens of hertz. And if we are using again a PID to characterize that, these are pulses with increasing, increasing uh, uh, frequency we're giving. And ultimately, the one showing here is sort of 50 hertz stimuli. And we still see a very strong modulation on a 50 hertz, on a 50 hertz time scale. Sorry, Venky, that it's so, so small. <laughs> so importantly, this means that we can now take a recorded order so and in principle replicate those kind of signal structures from day to day. And no, we don't have to rely on an, a good generative model of what's happening. We can actually give precise and sort of simplified, highly simplified, um, uh, simplified odor pulse trains. Um, importantly, with no change in overall flow, because we have several valves, so we can compensate flow quite well. So if the first question we need to ask then, well, can animals deal with this kind of, or can, can mice deal with this kind of temporally structured information? So for that, we need to train them, and it's expected that this training might be a little bit, a little bit of an effort, because as I think Leslie put very well, you can't ask and talk to flies, but unfortunately it's, Despite expressing FOXP2, you might not be able to talk to mice either. So, so it's just you can't tell them, pay attention to the odor source. You need to train them in a lengthy, in a lengthy um, uh, conditioning process. So what we've been working with for a while is we built this sort of cage where we have a group housed, uh, group housed dozens, dozens or 20 mice or so. Um, each chip tag, they get free food but have to um, walk and work for, um, for getting water. So which allows us to have sort of trained them on, on simple... Uh, go no go tasks for quite lengthy period of time. This is sort of the system which has evolved over the years thanks to our, our workshop. So there's a bunch of mice sitting in here in quite a happy environment that the Home Office, the regulatory authority in Britain likes a lot because they're actually, they're not really water deprived. They can go to water anytime they want. They have free access to food, social environment, and importantly, very little interaction with any, with any, um, uh, with any human. So they, if they want water, they just have to walk up, up these little stairs, go into a little separate separate um, uh, tunnel where they do a, um, where, they, where they essentially is a little operant conditioning box attached to it. And that allows us to, to measure many, many trials over periods of weeks or months. Importantly, they perform a lot during the night and not so much during the day as you would, as you would expect. And with a, each animal, the way we've set it up, uh, does approximately three, 400 trials per 24 hour period up to periods of, period of, tens, of tens of days. So this general system, allows for quite efficient and automatic conditioning of sort of cohorts of mice with some advantages that it's minimal human, minimal human interference, that it um, happens during their naturally active time at night, and we can do some automatic health control. And finally, um, maybe an underestimated point is we don't have to water restrict the animals. They can obtain water no matter when they want, so they're never dehydrated, unlike if you sort of don't, if you take them off water for 24 hours and then have a brief training episode. Um, so this set of... Um, set of advantages now allows us to maybe try to train them on correlated and uncorrelated stimuli. Um, so to, to, to determine this, we're not, um, we train them on a go-no-go -go conditioning task, but not instead of discriminating sort of simple odorants, we actually ask them to discriminate the same odors but with different temporal profiles. So these are going to be the two extreme stimuli we're starting off with, a rewarded stimuli, stimulus where two odors are highly correlated, and an unrewarded where they're actually anti-correlated, so the most extreme we can, we can try to do. This is an experiment that, as many, I think, olfactory uh, behavioral experiment comes with a lot of controls necessary and caveats. I will walk you through some of them we're doing. The first is, obviously, to calibrate the system such that there's no indication in total flow and no indication in, in total odor concentration averaged over one, one of these cycles. 
that is different between the S plus and the S minus trial. Um, we actually achieved that partially through carefully calibrating those different, different valves. And I think Paul can probably sing a long song about comparing individual, individual valves and their performance. We have to go through similar routes here. But also then, at some point, we add a little bit of noise to make sure that, there's no, that the, there is additional variability that makes it impossible to distinguish between those two stimuli based on an unintentional, unintentional parameter. Importantly, also, we use several valves to make up the blue odor, several valves to make up the red odor, and several valves to make up the compens compensatory um, um, airflow. This allows us to, from within each trial, to actually use a different combination of valves. So it's very difficult for the animal to, to pay attention to specific kind of click noise, and we can train them for extended periods of time. And importantly, if we, we, are, we start off with training animals on six out of those eight valves, and then we at some point introduce these two new valves that they've never seen before, and from everything, or from of the performance of all these other valves, there's no way to predict whether there's an S plus or an S minus stimulus coming up. So we can use those trials as being a completely novel set of valves, directions, or whatever the intricacies of our little uh, manifold, manifold might be. I'm going into the length of these control details because we had so many nice control discussions with Tim this morning. I thought I have to show them slightly unprimed. And then after a few days, we can just manually move around and refill fresh bottles and look how that's happening and then switch to these switch controls which controls again. So, um, and, yeah. No, we first, we first train them for about a week with, um, I don't know, Sinyol versus Eugenol or something, something unrelated. And then we use two new orders for the temple, for the temple structure. Um, so, um, yeah, more controls across frequencies, maybe I drop that. So we can we start off also um, with a relatively simple task. We do 2 hertz correlated versus 2 hertz anticorrelated, and the animals tend to, tend to learn that. This red group of animals is one where we actually, um, well, where valves are clicking in the same way, but, but the odors don't have any prediction, any predictive ability. And then we do introduce the switch, and here's an example of the first switch we're doing. So each row is one animal's performance, and you see in the different green colors things they got right, in the different red colors things they got wrong. And so, it, so these the hits or correct rejections, false alarms, misses, as people call them. And then we have this time that we switch where the first stimulus, there's no way for animals to be able to know whether that should have been an S plus or an S minus. And you see there are some animals that are perfect before that stay perfect afterwards, like these, these cases here. Others make some mistakes, but overall, there's no difference in the performance before or after. So for me, this is sort of the tightest kind of control we can do in this behavior because there's no way that animals can make this distinction except using using what we intend to put in, because it's a completely new, completely new system. Yeah. So this is, so these are, um, these are two hertz stimuli. So these are 500, uh, 500 milliseconds, uh, 250 milliseconds on, 200 milliseconds seconds off. So these, um, oops, sorry. Uh, so, no, so this, this, this length here would be, um, would be uh, 500 milliseconds, and then we're ramping up the frequency to see where up to what up to what frequency they're able to actually um, detect detect stimuli. Two hertz is maybe not so exciting, but we can. But this is sort of our maybe our star animal. And one example to show: we, we started training on two, three, etc., going going up at frequency up to 12 hertz. And we do a sort of switch control at 12 hertz, go up to 16, 20, 25, 30, and even at 30 to 50 hertz, the animals perform at 90, 95 percent correct. So this is sort of 30 hertz fluctuating stimuli, every sort of 30 milliseconds, if you average over 30 milliseconds, there's no difference between those two stimuli. And so the, this animal must have been able to somehow pick up the correlation structure of these stimuli on a 30, on a 30 millisecond time scale. And the population of animals, these are 14 mice and a few hundred thousand trials. So we, um, we, we see that performance goes down with frequency plotted here logarithmically from 1 hertz, 10 hertz to 100 hertz, up to on the order of tens of hertz, we see it seemingly different from chance line. I'm, I'm, I'm ref, I refrain from doing sort of statistics and comparisons here because, I mean, yeah, we can discuss with people who want to do, want to do that in a minute. I can in a minute, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, we, because we were suspicious, this is, I think, a relatively, uh, well, relatively extraordinary claim that mice are able to, to distinguish correlation patterns on the sort of 20 hertz time scale, so we repeated the entire set of experiments with a new cohort, slightly different training starts, so not so extensive training on low frequencies, but the second cohort of 19 mice, again, a few hundred thousand trials performed 
Same way, we have less variance here because we simply have more trials in these frequency bins in the tens of hertz range. And then we, at that, that point, we also had a, my, my very suspicious THC student wanted to have a control of a group of mice that are not receiving odorants, but the same valve clicking patterns, and those animals didn't perform anywhere near, anywhere near above chance for the entire frequency, frequency perspective. So this is the kind of realm where animals might be able to discriminate, so they, might, they are able to discriminate um, correlations up to, um, to tens, of, tens of hertz. So it's, um, it's, I think, similar to what we've done for a long time. We have bins, and they need to lick in, I think, um, two out of four bins. But I'm not 100% sure. I should know. But I'll, I'll, I'll let you know later. We... we we simply haven't, we haven't done that. When we, when we thought we ramp up frequency, and that would be the easiest way to make this relatively unintuitive task for them maybe, um, maybe work, but we haven't done explicit jumps. So we now then we randomly, ram randomly mix frequency between 1 and 80 hertz together to get this sort of large, large data set that maybe we should, we should do. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we try to do that with all the kind of controls we do in terms of making sure you switch to something new, you switch to different, different valves, and using this cohort of animals that gets the same clicking pattern and same directional pattern. So, and Yes, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was thinking that's with the, with, the, um, uh, with the pharmacological manipulation that Tim, Tim was mentioning, that that might be... I think you would like them to kind of have learned something and start and then kind of train the firm. But maybe, you know, yeah. I, I, I take the point. Start with Dan. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so the, different, the difference is whether the two odors are correlated or whether they're anti-correlated. And the anti-correlated case, we half the trials one odor starts, the other half, the other odor starts. Um, maybe the next slide asks you implicit, answers your implicit question. Yeah, so it comes up with that, but this is correlated, but it's actually correlated. Yeah. What you're showing us with the LD was not correlated versus not so much yeah. correlated. That's what we're doing exactly at the moment. Yeah. So it's, maybe you could live feed into it, but I don't know. Dima? Uh, so there might have been one control. If we try the order at the beginning, and then so, so, um, so <laughs> this is this is a little bit this experiment what we've what we've done. So I don't want to go too much into mechanism because that would open up an entire new avenue. I just want to kind of convince you of the of the phenomenon first. So that's sort of my goal for today. What one of the mechanistic ideas we had maybe, and that goes into Dan's direction. Maybe they detect onset, like what um, what Paul has shown very well in, in bees. So what we're doing here um, is we are training animals. So this is a cohort of animals that did. Does, does very well at sort of frequencies of 20, 30 hertz or above. So we took a frequency where they, where they just were able to perform in uh, this range. And then we, then we keep the stimuli intact, except that we alter the onset. So the onset might be instant. Although the pulse is anti-correlated, the onset will be correlated. Or the pulse is correlated, but the onset will be anti-correlated. So the prediction would be that if they detect onset, rather than the sort of correlation structure, performance should actually flip. So they should, should mistake the S plus for an S minus and the other way around. If, they are, if the onset is just part of the overall percept, it should maybe drop, drop slightly. And what we saw is exactly, exactly that, that it never flipped, but it just dropped slightly. So we think they're not detecting the, the very onset of it, but they actually take a little bit more time to integrate and, and actually use correlation across the entire structure. Dima is not convinced. Maybe he's... So... Um, we are we're in a physics institute, so I can use the blackboard. <laughs> so, if um, so, what we're what we're doing is we're so this is this is let's say the correlated the correlated stimulus. So this is this is the S plus and the S minus looks like um, looks like um, like um, like this um, and. 
and then we are sorry, and then we are they were introducing we're introducing probe trials where we are sort of changing this, but still still the rest of the trial trace uh, stays the same. So the onset is now is now not not uh, correlated but anti-correlated, whereas we're introducing in these trials we are making the onset the onset simultaneous. No, re relative onset between the two odors. No. Um, I thought I kind of um, managed to kind of manage the most sniff question. That's why we're measuring sniffing, or we're trying to measure sniff at the moment. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> so okay. maybe uh, maybe in the interest of time. Um, so we started looking at reaction times as well. Um, what we are what we see is that we're, what we're plotting here is performance, so perfect performance, chance performance as a function of um, as a function of uh, their reaction time defined by the first time of licking for the um, for the S plus trial, and you see that those animals that perform well are the ones that respond later, and this sort of curve becomes shallower, but still, if for high frequencies, those animals that perform around 70, 75% at 60 hertz are those that actually refrain from licking for a long period of time. So this is contaminated a little bit by the task structure that licking also indicates when they're, that they are action, but it is some indication that there needs to be some, some leng more lengthy integration over at least on the hundreds of millisecond time, uh, millisecond time scale. No, I think this this or suggests. I mean, I think what what Zach and Dima and we all all saw was that um, discrimination of two simple odorants, even if you mix them together, can happen very or does happen very very quickly within one sniff within within on the order of two three hundred milliseconds. Here now we're asking the animal to make a much more possibly much more difficult, but maybe also ethologically more relevant distinction, namely whether two odors are correlated or not. And that requires, that requires more time. No, this requires a long time. This is a second. So, um, so this is actually, um, so the scale here is one second. So um, the animals that perform at above, uh, uh, way above chance need, uh, have a reaction time of approximately, approximately 900 milliseconds to a second. So significantly longer than, than what Zach, Dima, and we had, had postulated. So this is, sorry? So, so let's maybe then come to, the, <laughs> to, come to my, my, my last slide. As I said, I don't want to go into a mechanistic interpretation, but hopefully, and if I haven't convinced you that the animals are able to detect temporal structure on the tens of hertz time scale, then I failed. I want to give you some notion that we think they are able to do that comes from physiology, because you know, as Linda and others have pointed out, you know, one should maybe do even more controls. To the, to the behavior. So one way to confirm that the animals might be able to discriminate those, those, those structured stimuli to actually look in the brain, whether we can see cells that differentially represent those stimuli. So we've started doing, um, doing a little bit of imaging of the output of the, of the olfactory bulb. Um, so, uh, so Charlie said I should have a picture of Karal. So I think this is the olfactory bulb, and these are the cells we are recording from, so um, mitocells. Um, and we find some examples, approximately 5% of cells, that show um, significant differences between um, between those two stimuli, the correlated and the anti-correlated one. So, um, but this is uh, very early stages. So, so this is a very preliminary, based on a few hundred, based on a few hundred cells imaged. We seem to see most, the highest percentage of cells at around 20 hertz. Um, I don't know whether that's real. We haven't understood, obviously, what's happening there. We haven't tried to directly record from those cells. We're now doing a little bit, um, of, a little bit of electrophysiology, extracellular unit recordings for throughput reasons, and there we also do find some cells that respond significantly different between the two types of stimuli. So the only thing I want to take away from the, from the physiology is that not only can we do behavior with a lot of controls that animals are capable of discrim discriminating temporal structure on the sort of 20, 30 hertz level, but we also do find some representation in the olfactory bulb sort of consistent with that. So let me, let me try, to, try to wrap up. So um, like many others, we find that naturally spreading odors have a very rich dynamics. 
um, we find that chemicals that come inspired by Hopfield's were chemicals that come from the same source, co-fluctuate and fluctuate in a highly correlated manner, and they're weakly or uncorrelated even for closely, sort of 10, 10 centimeter um, uh, closely spaced sources. If we build, we build sort of a fast order delivery device using these microdispense uh, solenoids that allow us to deliver um, orders with a bandwidth of 50 hertz or higher, and we can then use that to the behavior and show that mice can detect the correlation structure up to frequencies of uh, well beyond tens of hertz. Um, and, you know, confirming that, yes, the, the correlation structure is already somewhat represented in the output of the olfactory bulb. So stepping back, my conclusion would be that um, mammalian olfaction is, is not only fast, but it's actually also a high bandwidth sense that is able to detect and discriminate temporal structure in the environment. So by the way, I'm not trying to say that the animal knows these odors are correlated or anti-correlated. I think it simply, simply learns that they are different. We've done some extremely um, under, under able human experiments, my PhD student looking at trying to learn to discriminate those. It would be fascinating if someone who knows a little bit more about that uh, would actually figure out what the perception of humans is from, for those highly correlated and anti-correlated. Similar, whether people report anything that has anything to do with the chemicals or whether it's simply two different smells and they can't even tell whether they are correlated or not. So I'm simply saying that the temporal structure is something that the animal is implicitly able to, able to process. And I think that might be sort of the orthogonal dimension to the entire chemical space and allow us to understand how the local circuitry of your factory system extracts this kind of information. Finally, I want to, um, as Venki mentioned, we've just moved into this uh, beautiful new building, uh, Francis Crick Institute in central London. It's, uh, it's an amazing place, great, great colleagues, an amazing core-funded institute. And we are hi now hiring every autumn, hiring group leaders, early careers, so directly from postdoc. This is core-funded for up to 12 years for a group of six people, don't have to write grants, can use core facilities, no mouse costs, and a great, no teaching, is an incredible environment. So let me, if anyone's wants to know more, let me know. And finally, the, the people that have done all that are, really were spearheaded by an amazing PhD student, Andrew Erskine, who's just about to finish his PhD in the next, um, next six months or so, and was joined by two um, experienced postdocs, Tobias uh, and, and Tibanjan. Um, and yeah, they are the true driving, driving force behind that, and obviously thanks to, thanks to the funding sources for that. And thanks to all you for all the questions. Thank you.